Uh, and uh, we are so uh, happy and we welcome Alex Kaur. Um, and Jim Schuster is going to introduce him in a minute. Uh, just a reminder that I'm going to mute everyone, and I'm muting everybody right now. And um, uh, Alex, you can unmute, and Jim, you can unmute. And if you have questions, you can chat me. We will save time at the end to make sure everybody can have uh, questions. And um, so uh, with no further ado, um, Jim, please. Good morning to everyone. Uh, before I introduce Alex, uh, which I, I will do in a second, um, this week was, was Yom HaShoah. That's really part of the reason Alex is here, and this is part of our, our observation of that. Normally, we have in the past done this with a, uh, a, a brief ceremony you know, service in the sanctuary. That doesn't work too well today, but I did think that it would be appropriate to at least briefly uh, offer a quick prayer before I introduce uh, Alex and, and we get going. Uh, so that being said, we remember the six million who died when madness ruled and evil darkened the earth. We remember those of whom we know and those whose very names are lost. We cherish the memory of those who died as martyrs, those who died resisting, those who died in terror. We mourn for all that died with them, their goodness and their wisdom, which could have done so much to ennoble and enrich humanity. We mourn for the genius and the wit that died, the learning and the laughter that were lost. They are like candles that shine from the darkness of those years, and in their light, we know what goodness is. Amen. Uh, so that being said, uh, allow me to introduce Dr. Alex Kaur, uh, who uh, was born and raised in Terre Haute, Indiana. Uh, attended Butler and Purdue universities and it then became a podiatrist. He currently works at, I, I guess it's pronounced Witham Health Services in, in Lebanon, Indiana. He is a uh, avid tennis player and does a great deal of travel. As a matter of fact, uh, I first met him in 2013 when we traveled together to Auschwitz, uh, which he has done many, many times. Uh, he is a great brother and, and a devoted son. Uh, both of his parents were survivors of the Holocaust. That's what brings him to us today. Uh, his father, Mickey, currently lives in Indiana. He is a rabid Purdue Boilermaker fan. I think one could safely say that. Um, and I can't even tell you how many times Alex visits him beyond weekly. I don't know whether it's quite daily, but it's a lot. Um, he was liberated from Buchenwald in, in April of, of 1945. Uh, Alex's mother, Eva, is perhaps a little bit better known, certainly a little bit more outspoken. She was a, um, a, a survivor of Auschwitz and the twin experiments of, of Dr. Joseph Mengele, all of which I'm sure Alex is going to explain a little bit better to you. Um, she ended up uh, moving to, to Indiana and founding the Candles Holocaust Museum, which is still there, uh, as well as sponsoring and taking groups on annual trips to Auschwitz for many years, uh, and speaking, I think, literally throughout the world. Um, Alex has, was active in helping her with those trips and helping her deliver her message to, to the world. And since her passing on July 4th of 2019, has continued to do so. And that brings him to us today. That being said, he can tell you more about his background, their background, and so on. And I will just be proud to introduce my friend, Dr. Alex Kaur. Thanks so much. Um, I'm going to try to share a screen here. So we'll give this another try, Vanessa. And I think it's right there. One second. I'll let you know, A or nay. There we go. Excellent. OK, so I. I'm Alex Kaur, and I'd like to say thank you to Vanessa and Jim and, and your synagogue in, uh, I believe, Highland Park. And I, I went to podiatrist school in Chicago, so I know the city pretty well. Um, so over the next oh, 50 minutes, I'd like to leave 10, 12 minutes of questions. I'd like to talk, you know, essentially about my parents and perhaps growing up in Terre Haute. And, you know, a lot of this kind of is focus on identity. And, um, I first thought of this term years ago when I was lecturing with my mom at a prep school in Denver and just out of the blue, one of the teachers who was a friend said, I want you to give a lecture and this is a philosophy class. So 
you need to think of something abstract. So anyway, I came up with the word identity, and I, I really think more than that, you know, do we, any of us, have an obligation to the past, whether it's a personal obligation or religious? And so, you know, a lot of us um, wear, you know, many, many hats, and um, and I think that um, whether we're, you know, in our middle ages like I am, or uh, older than me or younger, you know, we're always wearing many hats, and I think that a lot of that has to do with, you know, our, our, our past. And as Vanessa and Jim said, both my parents um, are Holocaust survivors. Uh, to the left of your screen, that's my mom and I, and to the right's my dad. Uh, my dad's 95, and Jim, um, about July of last year, I moved my dad from Terre Haute to my hospital. We have a um, assisted living here. My dad's made an incredible recovery and he's doing really well. I see him every morning. I wake up in the I wake up, wake him up in the morning. I say Boker Tobe to get his mind thinking. I just went and saw him and I asked him, I said, what should I tell these people? And he said, I want you to tell them I did my best. So that's my dad's two cents worth today. I'm also a podiatrist and you might wonder how does being a podiatrist relate to being a child of two Holocaust survivors? Some of you may, may or may not know my mom's story, but she was a Mangala twin. And, um, you know, a lot of my philosophy as far as treating patients has to do with my mom being a Mangala twin. And you might ask why. And the big thing is I try to give every patient informed consent. And my mom was obviously like the other Mangala twins were never afforded that, that luxury or that, that, that privilege, if you will. Um, I'm a tennis player. I look a little heavy in the picture to the right. But um, how does this affect being a child of Holocaust survivors? Um, I've been in the Maccabee Games in Israel and um, several of the World Maccabee Games. I've uh, had uh, my mom's twin who passed away in 93, was there to watch me, my dad's brothers and uh, my dad's uh, brother, uh, my uncle. So really it kind of came full circle. And at once at Yad Vashem, I was asked to give a a talk um, because I was a child of two Holocaust survivors. Um, I do have a sister. We'll talk a little bit about her. She's not as involved as I am, although she's been to Auschwitz, she's been to Germany. She went on a lot of trips that, that I couldn't go on. And then I'm also actually a survivor. Um, you might ask what that has to do with anything. Um, was it 34 years ago, 1987, I'm, I became a victim. Uh, I had testicular cancer. And my mom had the words, you know, your dad's a survivor, I'm a survivor, you're gonna be a survivor. So really being a child of two Holocaust survivors really helped make it much easier for me to get through the chemo surgery and the ramifications of, of, of having testicular cancer. And here I am 34 years later doing fine. So, you know, is our past, are we a product of our past and do we have an obligation to that past? And I would encourage you during this, if there's something that you, a question, if you wanna send it to Vanessa or use the, um, the um, I'll answer any questions at the end, I'm more than happy, my life's an open book. This picture was taken in 1985 at Auschwitz, of course, I was 24 years old, a little younger. It was my first trip to Auschwitz. So we're gonna talk a little bit about my dad's past, a little bit about my mom's past, which some of you may know, and then kind of unite the whole story and talk about what's happened over the last 20, 30 years. My dad's from Riga, Latvia. That's a picture of him in grade school. Um, he is uh, one of, he was one of four brothers. Uh, his, his father, my grandfather was a shoemaker, believe it or not, and I'm a podiatrist. Um, at the start of the war in 1939, his oldest brother, Zori, was on a Latvian ship. He was part of the Latvian Navy. They found out he was Jewish and they threw him overboard. So he, he died. Um, at some point thereafter, my dad's father, who wore was very religious, wore traditional garb, was walking on the street and was told there were restrictions in Riga and he was told not to walk on the side of the street and he didn't obey and he was shot and killed. Um, so my dad um, was then with his mother and the um, two other older brothers. My dad was the youngest of four. And then at some point, um, they were in the Riga ghetto. And this is my dad years ago when giving a um, interview about, you know, his experiences with the Riga ghetto. And by this time he had already lost his father. And my dad would tell the story that um, 
that in the ghetto, because they were somewhat religious um, for Shabbat, one of the things that his mother took from the house, because they were only allowed to, to take, you know, whatever they could put on their on their person, um, they, she got a tablecloth, a red tablecloth, as I recall, and she put that every night on the ground, I'm sorry, for Shabbat on the ground, and that was her Shabbat dinner with the tablecloth on the ground. So that's always a vivid, vivid memory. Um, at some point, they liquidated the ghetto, and my dad was 13, 14, but he was pretty small for his age, so they divided the group like they would do in these situations, any selections, they put the older men and stronger boys to one side and uh, the women and younger children to the other. So my dad was with his mom, who he, he was a few years younger, several years younger than, than uh, his two older brothers. And he wanted to be with his mom. And at one point his mother, my grandmother realized what was about to happen. And uh, she shoved him into the line of uh, the older boys and men and um, the women and young children were then massacred in, in the rumble of force. There's a Chicago filmmaker who's, I believe his grandparents are from Riga, who did a movie called Rumble as Echo, and my, my grandmother was killed in the rumble of massacre. Um, so my dad, if he tells a story, always gets very emotional because he somewhat, to some extent, felt, felt guilty, somewhat survivor's you know, guilt, that he didn't stay with his mother, but he was shoved in the line with the older boys and men. He was then in um, uh, with the two older brothers. One brother actually was on some type of work detail. Um, and I, it's, there's a book called Unforgiven. Um, it's about a World War II, similar story where my uncle was on a detail and the Nazis said, this was at a labor camp. He said, you take this piece of log over your head, take it to the end of the field, come back, and then I kill you. And when, when he came back, my uncle Shlomo killed the Nazi and escaped and went to Israel. So at some point during this process, my uncle Leo and my dad were together in a variety of camps. Um, this is a Riga ghetto being liquidated. So toward the end of the war, as Jim said, my dad was outside of Buchenwald. And by this time, my dad was separated from uncle Leo and he was on a death march. And um, he thought this was it, the end was near. You know, if you stepped out of line, they, sh they would shoot you. And so it was kind of getting dusk. They were going around a ravine and my dad went, made a run for it. And um, my dad, when he tells the story, would say he runs like Edger and James, which was a fullback with the Indianapolis Colts. My dad's always stories have sports analogies. So they shot and missed him, he hid in a building, or the ruins of a building. They didn't go after him. The next day, here's nothing. The next day, there's bombing. The next day, he still has lice all over me. Here's a weird language. And the rumor was that the Americans uh, were in the area to liberate. So he heard the language. He thought, well, that's not Latvian. It's not German. It's not Hebrew. Maybe it's the Americans. So he came up with his hands up. And um, he was um, the... Uh, U.S. Army 250th Engineer Combat Battalion was there, and there was a gentleman by the name of Le uh, Lieutenant Colonel Andrew Neff. My dad um, was had lice, and they could tell he, you know, was in the camps, and so they gave him a Coca-Cola. I never knew this story until maybe 20 years ago, when we were little kids. My sister and I, we never had Pepsi; we always had Coke, Coca-Cola. And so my dad always thought and still thinks of Coca-Cola as his champagne. So they gave him American GI clothes and put him on a Jeep and he knew the area and the different terrain and, and uh, various languages. And so my dad's always been good with languages. So Lieutenant Colonel Neff had him in his Jeep and um, in, in American GI clothes. And this went on for several weeks. Um, at one point, um, the area, they get to a dangerous area and they said, you know, Mickey, you need, uh, we need to put you in a refugee camp. And my dad, all he knew was Lieutenant Colonel Neff was from Terre Haute, Indiana. Didn't know where Terre Haute, Indiana was. He didn't know if either of the two brothers had survived. So he's in a refugee camp and he starts writing letters. And this is one of the letters with his Coca-Cola, believe it or not, in Vienna. And he, this was after the war, I should say. But 
So toward the end of the war, he gets liberated. He's with the American GIs. He actually um, writes, starts writing letters after the war. Lieutenant Colonel Neff's wife gets one of these letters and says, you have to help that boy. And so um, in order to, um, he was hanging out with the GIs in, in Europe. And so Mr. Neff said, you need to write letters to show you can speak English. I can get you into American schools. And so he would write multiple letters. We didn't find these letters, my mom and I, my mom found them six years ago. And they're, they're beautiful, they're unbelievable. So, um, so at some point, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Neff goes back to Indiana, has uh, I think three or four kids. So he can't, can't put my dad in his home, but he finds another home down the street. And my dad at the age of 17 or 18 comes to Indiana minimal English, but he can still write. He's writing well. That's another long story I can tell you about how he learned how to write English so well. And so he gets enrolled in uh, high school because he missed four years of his life. And um, the family he was living with owned a pharmacy. So my dad worked in the pharmacy. And then he decides he wants to become a pharmacist that finishes high school. So for any sports fans, sports fans out there, he couldn't get into Purdue or, or Butler at the time. So Indiana State Teachers College, he could take his core classes. So it starts at Indiana State Teachers College, which is now Indiana State University. And um, he falls in love. My dad at the time was five foot two. He's maybe four nine now, but he was five foot two. He finds out that the basketball coach is also the gym teacher and he wants to learn how to play basketball. Well, um, that's Terre Haute. So believe it or not, that basketball coach, my dad's gym teacher, was some guy by the name of John Wooden. Yes, the John Wooden. The John Wooden that won 10 or 11 national titles at UCLA. So my father took the gym class. Uh, coach Wooden uh, took a liking to my dad and would teach my dad hook shots, um, similar to the hook shots he taught Bill Walton and Kareem Abdul-Jabbar years later. And um, so my dad is there another year and he decides to take the class again and Coach Wooden said, sure. And so then Coach Wooden goes to UCLA and my dad gets accepted to Purdue. Years later, uh, Wooden came back to Terre Haute. It was actually honored with a guy by the name of Larry Bird. And my dad sat at um, Coach Wooden's table and my mom took this picture. So we're gonna switch gears a little bit and I'm gonna try to kind of guide you through my tour here. So my mom, which some of you probably know, um, is from um, Transylvania, Hungary, Romania, um, and um, small town. She had two older sisters. She was a twin, as most of you know. The picture to the right is a family picture that my mom found after the war when she went back. Um, so most of you know the story, so I'm going to probably not be as detailed because I think there's more information at the end that I'd like to talk about. But my mom, Hungary, um, that part of Romania, Hungary, which is right on the border, was thought to be free of the Nazis. And then in um, spring, late winter 44, spring 44, um, they got wind that the Nazis were coming. At one point, uh, my mom's father, who owned a big area of land, in Ports Hungary, they try to make a go for it in the middle of the night. Um, and, um, and so they were met at the, end of their, um, at the end of their property by Nazi youth. They were told to go back. And a couple of days later, they were then put in a, in a, in a ghetto. Um, and then at one point the ghetto was liquidated. They were put on a train. Nobody told them where they were going on the train. Um, and at one point, when they would stop to be refueled, they would get water thrown in them. At one point, the language changes to German, but they knew that there was an issue, a problem. And so next thing you know, the cattle cars open up after three or four days on the train. They're in Auschwitz. My mom never sees her dad again when the cattle cars open, but before, just before the cattle cars open, her father says, if anybody survives this, you go to Palestine, you go to Israel. Um, my mom never sees her father, two older sisters. My mom's mom grabs my mom and my aunt, holds on to them tight on the selection platform. Some of you may know the story. Somebody's run up, up and down the selection platform, young yeah, twins, twins. They see my mom and my aunt and ask my mom's mother, my grandmother, if they're twins. My mom's mom says yes. 
is that good? And then next thing you know, they take my mom and my aunt out of her mother's arms. And the last thing she sees is her mom screaming and crying with her hands extended. It's the last time she saw my mom. So you can ask, typically at this age, my mom's nine years old, why most nine-year-olds, as I just told you, with my dad's experience were killed. Well, they were special, special, because they were Mangala twins. Mangala was in charge of the experiments. And so why was she not sent to the gas chambers? Because Mangala was trying to find a very crude way how he could multiply the German race, how he could um, essentially try to find fertility drugs. And he thought there was a genetic link between twins. So he would inject one twin with a drug to use the other one as a control. Um, so my mom, and my aunt were there from April of 44, liberated in January of 45. Um, there's a lot of interesting stories that happened. At one point in August or September, my mom could sense the Nazis were kind of losing the war. And one day she sees a plane above um, Auschwitz and my mom would tell the story. And I'm, when I first heard this, she said, I could tell it was an American plane. I go, how would you know at the age of nine it was an American plane. Well, she was a smart cookie, and um, she had an aunt that lived in Cleveland, and every year the aunt would send them letters to Romania. She recognized the postage stamp that was on the plane, so um, she knew that there was some hope here, and every day she would tell herself, and my, and mainly tell herself, she didn't want to give any um, concern or um, any thought to my aunt that things may not work out. Their goal was to be liberated. So uh, again, without informed consent, they were part of Mengel's labs. These are actually, my mom's name's not on this, but when you go to Auschwitz block 10, I think, or block six, I always get it, I forget. There's actually a glass case where you can see some of the data. We've I've seen data and essentially has my mom's name and when they were injected and what days. But beyond that, we don't really know the specific details of the experiment. Um, so again, the purpose of the experiments I've covered, these are pictures of the twin on the far right is my mom. Um, so my mom, if anybody, if you, any of you knew her, she liked attention and this was no different at this age. So uh, toward the end of the war, and I just tell this is a funny thing because I think humor is important. Um, at the end of the war um, in late December, uh, the Nazis fled. At one point, they came back to burn, blow up things, and they actually led my mom and the other twins, about 200 twins, on a death march back to Auschwitz I, from Auschwitz II, from Birkenau. Then they get to Auschwitz I, they vanish. And so at some point, the tw twins were left to themselves. Um, and so in late January 45, January 27th specifically, they see something moving in the background. And uh, it was the uh, Soviet Army Ukrainian division that's liberating Auschwitz. They give them cookie and candy and the soldiers are drinking vodka. And my mom um, tells a story a little different than the Auschwitz tour guides, but at some point, either days or weeks later, they then had this video taken. And my mom liked to be at the front, didn't know what it was about. But so they have these big cameras, and this was, if you talk to my mom, it was a week later, it was in February. If you talk to the Auschwitz tour guide, it was March. But the key thing to understand is that it's always known as a liberation video or pictures. It was not January 27th, even though that was when they were liberated. So my mom liked to go to the front of the line. So that's my mom and my aunt at the very front of the line. Um, if you see the video, and it's in my mom's last movie done by Ted Green Films and WFYI, my mom <laughs> tilts her head. This was like the sixth or seventh time they ran these kids through the barbed wire, between the barbed wire. And my mom got tired of it and like a nine or 10 year old sticks her tongue out. So, um, but that's my mom and my aunt and you'll see this picture several times throughout my lecture. So after the war, um, they end up in a um, monastery, which I actually just visited a year ago uh, near Katowice, which is not far from Auschwitz. Um, and the, the nuns there were the same color blue that my mom wore for years and years. We don't know if that's a connection. And then they go on a wild goose chase, finally ending up back in their village in Porus, only to find out that the dog survived, some pictures survived, 
There was an aunt that had survived, but her parents and two older sisters were nowhere to be seen. So eventually my mom with an aunt and, my, and her sister went to Israel. Um, and my mom, as she tells the story, would tell the story, was in a kibbutz and she learned how to say, I love you in 10 languages. Because these were all, all the other kids uh, were teenagers now from Europe who had survived the war. Um, and she and my aunt were in the Israeli army. My mom liked the beach. Um, my mom and my aunt were obviously identical. Just to tell you a funny story, my mom told the story a lot. Sometimes if they would go out with a, a, a guy and they didn't like the guy, they would never tell the guy that there was a twin. And so my mom always told this funny story that once uh, there was a guy she was dating and he had, he liked to have hands everywhere, if you understand what I'm saying. So at some point she brings him over to their apartment and my aunt's hiding in a closet. So at one point he's trying to kiss her or whatever and she gets up and opens the door of the closet, freaks the guy out because he's got two of two Moses twins there. So they always try to play little tricks. And at one point my mom, my, my aunt was a nurse and my mom one day went to work as a nurse and my mom went to work and my aunt went to work as, a, as an architect. So they, they had a good sense of humor. So um, in 1959, 60, by this time, my dad's a pharmacist in Terre Haute. Uh, he's single, there's no internet dating. So he goes to Israel to see his uncle Shlomo. Uncle Shlomo is the same brother of my dad that killed the Nazi, ended up um, in the resistance in Israel, ended up in the newspaper business. And so my uncle uh, uh, Shlomo introduced my mom and my dad. Uh, they were married, had a ceremony in Israel. And then my mom went from, she essentially went from Transylvania to Tel Aviv to Terre Haute. So my dad again was rescued by an American GI, was living in Terre Haute. And my mom comes to Terre Haute. Um, and I, that's a picture of my sister and I. And you could say that we had somewhat of a normal childhood. Um, you know, we went to the Arch and saw baseball games in St. Louis. That's me as a little kid in Israel, my dad on my uncle's porch. Um, so, you know, we played sports. Growing up was, was you know, I, I got to feel like I was a chameleon. When I was in Indiana, I was surrounded by non-Jews. When I was in Israel, I was surrounded by Jews, plus a lot of them were Holocaust survivors. So I kind of always felt like I could fit in any, any situation. My first language growing up was not English. Um, it's a funny story. My mom, after my parents were married, we moved, they were in Terre Haute. A year and a half later or so, I was born. So my dad's working as a pharmacist, and my mom knows no English, very little English. And my dad knew very little Hebrew. So my mom would watch this movie every day at 12 noon, and she would write down words, love, kiss, romance, hug. My dad would come home and say, I need you to tell me what these words mean because I'm watching this movie every day. What movie are you watching? Well, I don't know, there's kissing. Oh, you're watching a soap opera. My mom said, no, no, there's no soap. So that's how she learned how to speak English, um, by watching soap operas. So here I am playing tennis. This is a vacation we went to. So, you know, really things change, and this is not my home, but I wanted to represent um, probably 1973. Three, I was 12, 11, 12, 13 years old. There was a custom in Terre Haute that during Halloween, you would put paper towels, toilet paper people's houses, put soap on the windows. And um, these became very vicious. They would put dirty Jew, go back to where you're from. And it was very difficult. I was in fifth grade and these were my peers. And you know, I would hear in the locker room or wherever, or in the, you know, in the hallway, recess, what are you doing tonight? Oh, after I get done with my homework, I'm going to go, Mrs. Kaur, she's crazy. And my mom would call their parents and say, you know, this brings back bad memories for me. Well, what memory? Their kids are just having fun. No big deal. They're just all in the fun. So nobody understood anything. And it was my dad, on the other hand, would just kind of tune things out. And um, he didn't really, it didn't affect him nearly as much as my mother. And then really, a um, couple years later, you know, the movie Roots came out in the, it's 1978, if my dates are correct, there was a miniseries called Holocaust. 
And um, my mom was in this process of trying to search for answers. Yes, she knew her twin was in Israel. We would go and visit our relatives there all the time, but they didn't really talk in great detail. You know, the, the wounds were still fresh. And then we hear that there's gonna be this miniseries Holocaust. So the local NBC affiliate um, asked my mom the last night, I think it was a three part series the last night, could you come and, and tell us about your experiences after the, the movie? So we are all there in the studio and one of the scenes toward the end of the movie is a little, so it's my sister, my, me, my dad, my mom. And um, one of the scenes is a little boy kicking a soccer ball. And, um, and my dad starts crying hysterically. And um, I had never seen, you know, here I am 16, 17 years old, I never seen my dad cry. And I never really understood, you know, that he was in so much pain. And so, and then my mom, you know, kind of put the emotion to the side, not that she was stoked by any means, but went on and did a nice job. And this was really her first public appearance. And I kind of realized that I needed to kind of help my dad and at the same time encourage my uh, mom to continue to speak. And for me, this was kind of a telling point. And, you know, you could say that, you know, my dad um, liked to play tennis. Here he is a pharmacist. He loves playing the piano. He just played the piano the other day. Um, and he would kind of hide from his past. He, he became a big Purdue fan for 40 some years, went to Purdue football and basketball, and really wasn't overly involved when my sister and I would ask him questions. Most times he would answer with a joke. Um, yeah, you know, my Nazi experiences, I played ping pong against the Nazis. We knew that wasn't the case, but he liked to joke about things. My mom was more of an activist. And even before, even before 1978, um, after Bobby Kennedy and Martin Luther King were killed, my mom started a, the Head Start program in Terre Haute. This is a picture to the left, um, and this was how she kind of got involved and tried to understand how she could help and really didn't connect the dots, but I really think this was the start of, you know, what things came afterwards. Um, so in 19, um, oh, 84, 83, my mom went to a reunion of, of um, Holocaust survivors, happened to meet another twin, and then with her twin in, in Israel, started an organization called Candles. Uh, the museum wasn't open for 10 years later. Um, but in any event, um, I'm sorry, the museum opened a couple years later. But the point is that she started Candles. And then we decided, or she decided, that we're going to go in 1985 to Auschwitz. So the interesting thing for me was I had heard these stories since I was a little kid. And that first time, the picture I showed you in front of the um, railroad selection platform. Um, when I went that first time, 24 years old, I knew where everything was. I knew the story. I mean, and I, you know, I knew where everything was. I had never been there. It was really odd. And it's always something that, that for me is uh, something that really doesn't make any sense. But yet again, this was something I lived with. And so I kind of knew the story. But my mom, and they, they found, you know, over 100 twins. And then they went in 1980, we went in 1985. To Auschwitz, and then the next week we had a mock trial of Mengele, um, and that kind of increased the public's knowledge of Mengele, and then asked a lot of questions. And then, as you may or may not know, his bones were found in Brazil, which we can debate and talk about that. And so, this is my first trip to Auschwitz. Um, got about five to ten more minutes here, so I'm going to kind of go over some highlights or lowlights. And this is definitely one of the lowlights. Um, in 1986, my mom um, was <clears throat> in D.C. mainly to call attention to the Mangala twins. A lot of the Mangala twins were suffering much worse than my mom was. And she had a sign, which I think is in her left hand here in the picture, that says Mangala twins support House of Representatives bill, whatever, 215, was just to get reparations money. She didn't have a permit. Uh, Ellie Wiesel was on stage talking. This was during, and Reagan was about to appear. This was during Yom HaShoah's services in the Capitol Rotunda. And so she was arrested. And um, if you have seen the movie by Ten Green Films and uh, WFY, Eva A-7063, he actually found the footage. That's where I got this picture. Um, and, you know, I wasn't there. She went there by herself. Um, there was a big article, which this is from the Washington Post, 
you know, bystander, rotunda, arrested by the Capitol Police. Um, and my mom, I can recall very vividly, you know, they release her, she flies back to Indiana. She was, she was paranoid. She thought, okay, they're gonna come and, you know, this is a country, the land of the free. How could they do this to her? And now she thought they were gonna kill her. So finally, we get through that. And she goes through a period that, you know, in my mind, in the late eighties, which is, she was kind of just spinning her wheels. Um, the following year, um, me, her son has cancer that same, and I survived obviously that same year, my aunt goes into kidney failure. My mom being an identical twin donates one of the, her kidneys to my aunt. When they took the, the kidney out of my aunt for the transplant, that kidney had not developed beyond the age of 10, which is when the experiments were done. So in 1993, my aunt dies. We actually had flown her a year earlier to Indianapolis, the same doctor that treated me here at IU, treated my aunt, and actually for nine months, she was free of cancer and then unfortunately died. Um, and so this was a bad time for my mom. She was searching for answers, never had attended a funeral because that day when my aunt died in Israel, her oldest daughter, very religious, wanted her buried that day, so my mom couldn't even make the funeral. A lot of pain. And so then we come to the topic of forgiveness. Um, and let me just try to summarize this. So after my mom is trying to mourn her sister's death, she gets a phone call three months later saying that there's a Nazi doctor that, that knows about the experiments. And my mom's theme, and she always had to have a theme or a focus. And she um, was trying to help the other Mangala twins, that particularly that had both sets of twins. So she thought, great, I'll go meet this Nazi doctor. Maybe he knows what Mangala did and maybe we can prevent what happened to my sister. And um, so they go, to, initially the meeting was at his home in Germany. She's there with a, a Dutch TV crew who, a lady from Indiana, I'm sorry, a lady from the United States, Susan Severide, whose uncle is Eric Severide, if you remember that name from CBS. So they film it. And during the interview, Mooch, Dr. Hans Mooch, who actually was cleared of all charges, um, he was known as the good Nazi. Um, and I can tell you the, his whole story, but he, he was put on trial after the war. At the end of the war at Auschwitz, he actually saved about 20 some Jews by making up fictitious experiments. He gave one of his guns to the doctor, one of the doctors. When his trial came up, he was the only one that was not sentenced to death. The 20 some Jews who happened to all be Jewish doctors testified in his behalf. He went back to practice uh, medicine in Germany, had heard about my mom and wanted to meet her. And he's telling my mom, you know, this is a nightmare I live with. And my mom said, nightmare? I thought we were the ones with a nightmare. He said, no, I." Under, you know, I had to sign the death certificates. So he goes through the process of what happened with the terrible gas chambers. My mom said, you know, I'm constantly bombarded by revisionists, Holocaust deniers. This information is very important. By chance, would you come with us to Auschwitz next year and a year and a half? We're going back for the 50th anniversary. He said, of course I would. And would you sign a document at the ruins of the gas chamber to say that there was indeed a Holocaust? He said, of course I would. So my mom goes home to Terre Haute after this meeting, and th this picture you're looking at is at Auschwitz, so it's a little out of order, um, goes back and tells me about the story. I'm gonna bring a Nazi to Auschwitz. And I said, mom, how is that gonna work? Um, and so she, well, I'm gonna give him a gift. I said, okay. So she goes to the local Hallmark store, two hours looking for a card for a Nazi doctor. That didn't work out. Thinking about champagne, nothing fit. And then one day she comes up with an idea, I'm gonna give him the ultimate gift. I'm gonna forgive him for being a Nazi. So at the ruins of the gas chamber, January 27, 1995, she, she forgives him publicly. And he wasn't aware that this was gonna happen. He signed a document beforehand. And my mom realized that this was a gift to Dr. Mooch, but it was a more important gift to herself that she really felt like she had taken this chip off her shoulder and she was happier. And a lot of people misconstrue this. They say she's doing this on behalf of other survivors, other families. She always made a point, if you ever see the video, in my name only. Now I will agree with some of you that this is so public, that she made this so public. Why does she have to do that? 
And that is a valid criticism. But my mom saw the incredible change in her personality. So uh, other people would come to her and ask her, how can I forgive my husband who cheated on me? How can I forgive, you know, somebody, a young girl that was raped by somebody? So she would get all these unusual requests to show how her forgiveness helped her. That's when she became more public. And then that 1995 museum reopens, um, or I'm sorry, opens, I should say. My father, and we'll try to finish up here in the next couple of minutes. Um, my father, my mom was still working as a real estate agent. So my dad reluctantly lectured one day a week. A good day for him would be nobody coming in. He could listen to his political program. One day a class came in, expected my mom to be there. My dad gave his first lecture. And from that point on, he would lecture and he lectured a lot. He gave a lecture a little over a year ago. Um, so he still talks about his experiences. And my mom continued to lecture and we went to Auschwitz multiple times. Um, the picture on the right is, I want to say 2005, it was one of the big anniversaries. Um, as some of you know, um, in 2003, um, the museum was burned down by a white supremacist. It was rebuilt. Um, a movie by a Chicago filmmaker, excellent movie by Bob Hercules, who lives in Evanston, uh, Forgiving Dr. Mangala, was released. And so for me, and I'm going to try to finish up here, so I'm uh, very eager to answer any of your questions. You know, I've been to Auschwitz over 20 times. The picture on the left was the last picture I took with my mom. Uh, the next morning she died. Um, picture on the right is a common picture where one of the barracks where she would always take pictures with other people pointing to herself. And then the picture there on the top right is interesting. So my mom had this incredible sense of humor that I've kind of alluded to. Uh, I think on the top right, she was practicing some dance moves. My mom never drank alcohol. The lady on the left in the picture with a sombrero was trying to and try to joke with me that my mom was drunk. She didn't drink any of that. Uh, my mom was still was searching for a, I'm still single. I'm still uh, looking, still Jewish. So once she posted something on Twitter, that soul made on her feet. And then the, she always liked taking selfies. And I think this was her last selfie. She gave this lecture to Indianapolis Rotary Club, I think June of 2019. My dad, my mom had some interesting friends. Uh, for some of you younger, Nikki Six is on the far right. He's a rock and roll singer with Motley Crue. Um, the long story short there is that my mom was uh, ran Marshall in the 500 and on the red carpet, this guy comes up with long hair, tattoos, earrings, and my mom hated that. And he goes, hey baby, let's take a picture. She looks at me, cameras are going off. And I looked at him and I thought, I know him, but I don't know how I know him. And it turned out it was Nikki Six, and they became friends. And my mom went out to did his radio show, and then my mom had problems with his shoulder, and so with her shoulder. So Nikki was sending her CBD oil, and so um, and then the middle picture is Elliot Gold and Ed Asner. They've been we were good friends. They came to Terre Haute, um, and I could tell you some funny stories about them. My mom, uh, this picture of the top left is my mom and dad with the University of Evansville basketball team. They came to the museum. The coach, Jim Cruz, is a friend of mine. Uh, the two pictures on the right are the Davidsons men's basketball team. For some of you, Steph Curry plays for the Golden State Warriors, played at Davidson. He's not in this picture. but um, And this is the same picture at the bottom right. And a lot of these kids um, have kept in touch with me since my mom passed away. And, the coach, Bob McKillop, taught European history in high school, so he always had an interest in uh, talking, lecturing his, his kids and students about the Holocaust, and he heard about my mom. Interesting experience. My dad's had a pretty good life, as I said. He'll be 96 in six months. He's just down the hall. Big Purdue fan. Uh, he had a 95th birthday in October here in the hospital, um, and so... The middle picture is at a Purdue basketball game. The picture bottom right is a Purdue football game. And, you know, just to summarize, got a couple more slides here. You know, my dad is obviously not as outspoken, but he had a lot of good lessons for my sister and I. One is always be honest, be hardworking, be humble, always say thank you and be polite and be tough. And, you know, most people, you know, think that my mom's tough and she was. My dad's really tough. I mean, he's gone through a lot the last four or five years. 
My mom, these are some of her life lessons, never give up, you know, um, you know, prejudice is terrible. Judge people on, on their actions and the content of their character. Forgive your worst enemy. You will hear her soul and set you free. She always talked when she had audiences with kids to make sure that, that the parents um, give their kids an extra hug and vice versa. And then to kum alam, to, to be the change, repair the world. It's all, it's important to all of us. And this is somebody sent me a picture with the, one of the messages here. So just in summarizing everything, yeah, I think I have a big obligation to my past. Um, my work as a son is not done. Um, podiatrist, I try to be as ethically as ethical as I can. Being a tennis player as much as I play, I try to spread the word about my parents. My sister's had some challenges. She's a really super bright girl. She has a degree in aeronautical engineering. Uh, there is a stigma associated with second generation. Um, post-traumatic stress disorder. When my sister was in junior high, she was having a lot of issues and she could see that my mom was troubled by what was going on. And I think my sister, instead of being so outspoken and telling what was bothering her, kept things in. So she doesn't really get involved. She has kind of a love-hate relationship with my mom. And obviously that has never really been resolved since my mom died unexpectedly. And then I talked to you briefly about being a survivor. This is a picture I always likes, 1967. We took the same picture um, a couple years ago. And if you ever come to downtown Indianapolis since October, November, just north of Banker's Life, there's a big mural. Um, uh, it's supposed to be up for five to 10 years. The same lady that did this did the Reggie Miller and the Kurt Vonnegut mural. It's 53 feet high. I'm obviously proud of it. One last thing is very important, very important. Tomorrow is National Grilled Cheese Sandwich Day. Why is that important? When I was a little kid, we didn't have enough money for a microwave. We didn't have a lot of the common things that people had in their kitchen. So my mom, every Sunday after we came home from synagogue, Sunday school, she would make us iron sandwich. A couple of years ago, my film, this, this is from the film, my mom demonstrated how she used an iron to make iron sandwiches. I had friends coming over because on Sundays they wanted to know what this iron sandwich thing was. That is it. So I think we've got some time and I'm more than happy to, uh, Vanessa, do I want to unshare? Uh, I'll do that for you. Okay. I'm good. I'm good. Um, what a beautiful presentation. We can't thank you enough. And um, I have one, I'm going to start crying, Alex, but oh, another thing I thought you were going to say about being a podiatrist is that many survivors say that they, um, you know, that they had heavy shoes on oh. is how they survived. And um, I thought you were going to allude to that because, you know, they had so many injuries and, um, you know, things that happened to their feet. My mom's experiences were different. She didn't have shoes that fit her. And so she would always tell the story at the end of the war when the Nazis had fled, they went to the Canada building, which was at the far north end of Auschwitz. And she found a pair of shoes that were two times her size and she was clumping around. And then the liberation picture, her shoes are like three times the size. So all she told me was her shoes wore out. And at the end of the war, she got new shoes. They were brand new shoes, but they were three times her size, but she loved them because the, they were warm and they were big, but um, no, I'm I'm aware that I was thinking at some point to do a study about you know the feet of Holocaust survivors, but right now I got too many other things cooking. Yeah. Um, uh, let's see what we have here. Um, what was your mom's reaction to the Candles Museum being bombed and and set a fire? Yeah, November eighteenth, two thousand and three. My mom's reaction initially was. Poor, rage, upset, um, and then like true to her form, you know, she rallied around this cause and said, well, we're not, you know, there were thoughts to move it to Indianapolis at that point and to move it to another area. She said, no, if we move it anywhere, the people that did this went. I want it back in the same spot, same area, same ground, and that's where it stands today. And so um, it was a community-wide support. Um, they, they, there was, there was a, 
uh, inner church um, service immediately afterwards with all the other churches. And there's only one synagogue in Terre Haute. And so she really rallied around this and got some big investors to help out um, and rebuild the museum. And her, her main thrust was to not let them win. And by winning, that would be move it to anywhere except where it is today. Um, I also have another question. Um, at the Illinois Holocaust Museum, there's holograms where you ask survivors questions. Uh, Spielberg has um, has interviewed survivors. Did your um, either of your parents um, participate in any of those programs? My mom's in the hologram. There's a hologram, my mom in Skokie. Um, my dad did not want to do the show project. My mom did the show project. The funny story about the hologram, which is in Terre Haute, in Skokie, for, um, Los Angeles. Funny story. Um, my mom tells me that she was selected. I was living in D.C. to be in the hologram. I said, oh, that's nice. So she said, well, I have to meet somebody in, Los in D.C., so I'm going to come and stay with you. I said, fine. So I remember there was a reunion of Holocaust survivors and she's got to meet this guy named Stephen Smith. So I see a picture, I look him up online, I see a picture, I think, well, it's him over there. So she goes to talk to him, I walk away. And next thing I know, she's gonna be in the hologram. After my mom's passing, Stephen Smith came to Terre Haute to do part, part of the memorial. The night before the memorial, he says, well, you know the story about your mom's hologram. I said, well, yeah, you guys selected her. He goes, oh, no, no, she selected us. I go, what are you talking about? Well, she called him and said, Mr. Smith, I hear you're doing a hologram and I want to be a part of it. And Stephen says, well, Eva, you know, yes, it's a little early. It's very expensive. And we, you know, the technology is not there. Well, whatever you're doing, I want to be a part of it. Well, Eva, there's a lot of survivors. It's really expensive. I'll get the money. Well, how can we meet? Well, Eva, I'm going to be traveling. Well, where are you going to be? Well, I'll be in New York, and then I'll be in D.C. Oh, I'll be in D.C. too. I'll see you there. So he told me, sorry. He, sorry. He told me when he met her, his whole idea was to say no, that you're, you know, we've already got our 12 people. So he, whatever my mom said, she convinced him that she understood that how, how important this is for future generations. If you ever go online, you can. It's a he does a a, um, a a PowerPoint, and it's really funny. If you put an Eva Core and Stephen Smith, it's one of the first ones. It's hilarious, and he um, he's been a big supporter ever since. Yeah, I'm um, Jim. Um... Schuster said he's also part of the Aegis Trust and one of the major movers behind the Rwandan Genocide Museum in Kigali in Rwanda. He's a um, great guy. Did, um, did your parents get involved in current politics or, you know, with the white supremacists, Indiana not known for its, uh, I, whatever Indiana is known for, I, I'm not 100% sure. So I'm showing you a picture. I don't know if you can see it. It keeps Probably. going in and out. Yeah. Anyway, so when my parents there, involved there. In politics, yeah, my right parents there. involved in politics, 1968, my dad's standing next to Bobby Kennedy. Nice. So yeah, yeah my parents were very, very patriotic. Um, to vote was, you know, an honor. Very into politics. Um, and they, um, you know, we, when I, I can remember 1968 after Bobby Kennedy was assassinated, I mean, it was, I remember it very well. And so, yeah, politics, even now, my dad at age 95 is still interested in politics. And I think you'll, you see this a lot with Europeans, particularly Holocaust survivors that are so happy to be free. And then they unite again around this patriotism, no matter what side of the political aisle you're on. So yeah, my parents were very, always the news was on 24 seven. Um, I think that you taking, um, you know, their legacy forward um, is so, so important. Um, we've had other um, survivors speak to our um, both congregations and um, tell me more about, you know, what do you see for you as you look forward? And maybe also tell everybody a little bit uh, more about the Candles Museum in Indianapolis. Yeah, so, you know, the one regret I have with my mother is I never sat down and, and said, what 
should my role be after, you know, you're no longer here. I never had a chance. She died literally in my arms. Mm. So I never had that chance. Um, but right now, my main goal is to keep my dad healthy and alive. Um, and we're doing okay there. Um, he had a good day yesterday. He watched golf and normally doesn't watch golf at all, but got him interested in golf. Um, so I don't really have a path that I know of. I mean, I'm trying to do whatever I can and I'm not in any way married to any, anything I can do to further my mom's message. Within two weeks of my mom's death, there were two editorials, op-eds, one in the Washington Post, one in the Jerusalem Post, criticizing my mom, mm. using incorrect statements about her forgiveness. And I agree, forgiveness is not for everybody. And I see both sides of it. So when I saw that, it was literally in the later the month of July, 2019, I said, well, this is one thing I'm gonna do is at least stand up for my mom, because she's not here to stand up for any of these people. So I wanna continue her legacy in any, any shape, manner, or form. Candles Holocaust Museum is still in Terre Haute. Obviously with the pandemic, my mom's passing, we're, we're struggling a little bit. Um, and there are some changes coming, but it's my hope that it continues to be, um, you know, thriving in Terre Haute and to be successful. Uh, there are other efforts around the country in Indianapolis here, the Indiana Historical Society will have an exhibit in 11 months, uh, much of what I had as a collection. And also from the movie eBay-7063, uh, Ted Green and WFY donated that to the Indiana Historical Society. I think it's gonna be a special collection. Um, and really I try in any way I can to, you know, whether it's lecturing to a high school class of 20 or something bigger than like this, you know, anything I can do to further the message. And I do think, I think it's important um, that as time goes on, there are going to be less and less Holocaust survivors. And like my dad, he doesn't talk too much anymore about his experiences. And the other thing is, I do run into a lot of second generation similar to my sister that are in no way in, in, involved so i think it's this goes back to what i talked about as a title i think i have an obligation to do whatever i can to at least at the very least tell my parents story um right wrong or indifferent and it, obviously my mom's forgiveness brings up a lot of discussion but some second generation aren't as involved some get involved later but you know, I think at some point there won't be any Holocaust survivors, and this is all in the history books. And sometimes, you know, history books change, and that's what I'm concerned about. Right. Uh, you want to be part of writing the history, and you want to be part of making sure the legacy goes on. And we certainly thank you. A lot of um, beautiful tributes in the chat, <clears throat> Alex. Uh, we have time for like maybe one or two questions. Um, you can raise your hand. Um, I am going to put on the galley view so I can see everyone. Um, Hanoch, yeah, do you have a question? And you need to unmute. Hanoch, we still can't hear you. Still can't hear you. Um, Maybe you can um, put it in the chat. Um, and while you're working on that, um, Tim asks, do you wanna speak more about the controversy of your mom's forgiveness? There's a lot of ways to answer that. First of all, a lot of people say that this is against some of the principles of Judaism. And I think you could argue that it, it is or it is not. And so I think that's debatable. Some people say, well, this is more of a Christian perspective on it. And my mom would tell you this has nothing to do with religion, zero to do religion. It has to do with her finding a gift that she could give herself and that other people who are maybe not survivors of the Holocaust, but have uh, an unforeseen um, activity happens against them that they could forgive the perpetrator that would make them feel better. It has nothing to do with justice. The people still need to acknowledge their crime. The people still need to acknowledge their wrongdoing and show some, you know, showing remorse would be helpful. But obviously in this situation, Mangala was no longer here. So the other angle is that was my mom speaking on behalf of other Holocaust survivors? It really is something that she, she was not. She was speaking in her name only. And as I said earlier, 
a criticism that you know she speaks um, against other survivors, I, I really disagree with. My mom didn't like the idea of victimhood. And she at times would portray some survivors as victims or as good victims. And she would even include my dad as this. And I, that part, I think my mom at times would go a little overboard with, but she was trying to prove a point that she no longer felt like a victim. One route is to forgive. There are other routes, there are other paths to make yourself happy. And I can tell you that my dad, over a period of time, decided to have a news conference or press conference at one point because his favorite basketball player was Dirk Nowitzki. Dirk Nowitzki is German, and my dad wanted to publicly say that he was a Dirk Nowitzki fan, that if, and if his grandparents were Nazis, he forgave them. So um, the controversy continues, and I think hopefully with me speaking about it and at least acknowledging that I agree that it's not for everybody. In the movie EVA-7063, there is a, um, a former dean of the Duke School of Divinity, it says, look, you may not agree with her forgiveness, but at least it's an option. You now know, you can't say that nobody has done this, and it's at least an option. So if you are in a situation where you think forgiveness might help you, you have at least somebody to, to follow their example. Um, I think that um, as someone who's heard a lot of uh, speakers, as you sprinkle your talk with um, your love of sports and um, your dad's is something when you talk to kids, they're really going to appreciate. And, um, you know, I could, you know, I have a Larry Bird um, um, fan in my house. So uh, it, those type of things, I think, just bring it, bring it all alive. You're getting a lot of thank yous. Please re read the chat, Alex. Yeah, I, I see him. Okay, good. And thank you. Thank just, you so much and take Jim and your, your synagogue and, uh, you know, maybe in the future when we're done with the pandemic, we can meet in person. But I, I wanted to thank you all very, very much for this opportunity. And I'm going to go now down the hall and hang out with my dad because he's about to eat lunch, I think. So. Okay, please give him our love and our regards. And we'd love to come see you and maybe even see the museum. Okay, okay. be well, everyone. And um, it's really a wonderful morning. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good day. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye-bye.